So thank you very much, Dan. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Magali Poineau to discuss about intellectual property. As you know, as soon as we discuss about IMI and IMI project, intellectual property questions uh, arise, and we were fortunate to have uh, Magali with us at the executive office. Uh, as I always explain, we have at the executive office an important role of honest broker to play, and this especially applies to intellectual property. And uh, what uh, Magali will do now is to explain the overall principle of the IMI intellectual property policy, as well as the way this uh, policy is uh, implemented. We will enter now into more technical detail regarding the, the rules and the procedures that are applicable in IMI. I explained by Michel Goldman uh, before, and IMI consortia are composed of different partners. On one side, we have the uh, FPI company, the pharmaceutical company, but on the other side, we have all these academic partners, SME, patient organization, and regulatory organization. And on one side, we have this pharma company not eligible for IMI funding, and all these companies, the academic, non-profit research organization, and SME, are those considered as eligible for funding. That is to say that they will receive uh, IMI funds to carry out the research within IMI project. And to that end, all this activity will have to be carried out in a member state or in a country associated to the FP7. In order to be reimbursed, we are considering different cost category. We are uh, considering the direct cost, which covers the uh, consumable, the equipment, also the personable costs, uh, the subcontracting activities, uh, but it may be also covers the conference fee. And it's very important in IMI to be aware that now we really would like to fit to the usual accounting system of all participants. That's the reason why we not only consider the use of uh, actual cost, but also the use of average personal cost. It really depends on how these costs are reported in the accounting system of each of these eligible company. And for the SME owner, which do, who do not receive a salary, they will be able to use a flat rate to simplify uh, the reimbursement procedure. We are also considering all these indirect costs, that is to say the overrate. Before, we were only considering applying a flat rate of 20% of the direct eligible cost, but now we are also considering the actual indirect cost. Really, as I mentioned before, to ensure that it will be easier for each of the participants to report this cost by following their usual accounting practices. All these direct and indirect costs will have to follow eligible, uh, eligible criteria. That is to say that this cost, of course, will have to be actually incurred, but incurred by the participant who will declare this cost, will be recorded in the accounting system of the participant claiming this cost, and according to the normal uh, management accounting practices. But on the other side, EU fund will have to consider also non-eligible costs, that is to say that as an example, VAT, uh, all indirect taxes, but also debt and so on, won't be considered for the reimbursement by IMI. And it's important to understand that we really would like to avoid double funding, that is to say that the cost, but you most probably already know that, already reimbursed by another uh, EU program can be reimbursed by IMI. We are, we, we, are, we are reimbursing costs according to two types of activity. 
the research activity and all the other activity. The research activity may be reimbursed to a maximum of 75% of the total eligible cost, while all the other activity, including dissemination activity, training activity, but also communication activity, will be reimbursed 100% of the cost, eligible cost that will be declared by a participant. And a very important novelty in IMI that has been uh, approved recently in case an institution, and we are especially thinking about SME, an SME start uh, working uh, in, involved in an IMI project which lose its statute during the implement of the uh, it's, it's statute during the implementation of the IMI project, it won't have any impact on the funding uh, principle. That is to say that it was eligible to be, it was eligible to receive IMI funding, even if, even if this SME is not anymore an SME and as a principle is not anymore eligible, because of this new rule, this uh, entity will be still eligible to receive IMI funds. Just one word on FPR contribution. This was mentioned before uh, by Michel. They are providing in-kind contribution covering personal, consumable, and, and so on. And all this uh, cost, all this contribution will have to be reported by RMI according to their usual accounting principle. It was not foreseen for the fifth call, but it, there is also an opportunity to consider costs ca uh, for activity carried out outside EU. But as I mentioned, this won't be considered for this fifth call, but will most probably be considered for the following calls. It's also very important to understand that IMI try to be very flexible. And to achieve this objective, we have simplified all the application process, but also the reporting procedure. That is to say that we, have, we, have provide, we are providing now a more user-friendly system to apply to IMI project, and we also try to reduce the time to grant. You have seen in the, in the previous slide for the fifth call timeline, we are launching the call right now, and we intend to have the grant agreement signed by the end of the year. That is to say that we, have, we really expect to have grants signed within nine months from the date of application. That's a very short time, and to that end, in order to achieve this objective, we really try to focus on scientific information less than on administrative information that might be requested to participants. We also simplify the reporting process. How? First, when participants have to provide certificate by external auditor, we reduce the number of certificates that may be required by uh, the uh, different participants either because they have already a methodology certified within FP7 or because they have a um, report less than a certain threshold. And we really would like to reduce this number of administrative procedures. Consequently, we also harmonize the reporting period. Depending on the starting date, the reporting period, the anniversary date of the project, will be only either on July or on December. Practically speaking, it implies if one entity is participating to several IMI projects, they won't have to make all this reporting activity every month depending on the start date, but only on July or on December. Also, by asking the auditor, not only intervening every month, but only twice a year. That will really help in the process. <laughs> 